I have often been puzzled by two related questions. Why do people so rarely change their minds on important matters? And why, nevertheless, do people think that they are reasonable and think that those who disagree with them are not reasonable? <laughs> now, another way of phrasing the question is how and why do people think they know things? Now, what does it mean to know? And in everyday language, we, there are really two conditions for using the word know. One is the absence of doubt, and the other is that the proposition in which you believe must be true. We can't say that he knows something that's wrong. But in fact, subjectively, the only thing that matters is the absence of doubt. And there is no subjective difference between true and false beliefs, and there are many false beliefs. So we think we know many things that, in fact, are not the case. And this is generally true, and it's, if you think about that, uh, we are to some extent perverted by, by our, our idea that we know things through science, but in fact there are many different ways of knowing things, and uh, people who are deeply religious and not particularly scientific, they know things. And there is no psychological difference between the way they know things and the way that we consumers of science know things. The reason I believe in global warming and in, in the fact that the Earth is round, well, I've seen pictures of the Earth being round, but, but uh, the reason I believe in most of the thing that I believe is that I've been told that by people I trust. And exactly the same is true for religious people who believe in things that scientists do not believe in, and they believe them because they have been told those things by people they trust. And they know those things to be true. There is more than one way of knowing, and we had better used to the fact that it's a psychological problem how we get to think that we know things. Now, in a book I published a couple of years ago that uh, Maya alluded to, I presented a view of the mind in terms of two systems, system one and system two, sort of two fictitious characters. They don't really exist in the brain as systems. But fast, the fast system is automatic, and it really runs our mental life most of the time. The slow system requires attention and effort, and it is involved typically when things get difficult. The fast system continuously produces and maintains a representation of the world around us. We see things with system one, or with fast thinking. System two, the slow thinking, comes into play when system one is in trouble. That is, when we encounter a difficulty, when a question arises. We reason about things with system two. And believing, as it turns out, is mostly like seeing and not like reasoning. And here comes a truly important psychological fact. I think we don't know how our mind works. We tend to think that our mind works, that we have beliefs because we have reasons for these beliefs. But in fact, this is not the way that beliefs come about. This is not that's the way that subjective knowledge comes about. Uh, subjective knowledge is to be explained by how are beliefs produced without doubt. Now, the two systems go with two ways in which ideas can be coherent. So reasoning comes with logical coherence. So it, that's the type of coherence that's associated with operations of reasoning. So if you believe that if A is true, then B must be true. And if you believe that A is true, then you also believe that B is true. That's the kind of thing, that the kind of logical coherence. But system one, and actually our mind really, works with a different notion of coherence, which is associative and emotional coherence. And where ideas are coherent, not because one follows from the other logically, but because they fit. And you know, there are many examples of ideas that fit, but uh, here is an idea that doesn't fit. The idea that Adolf Hitler really liked children and dogs, and he was extremely nice to children. And there is, you know, this, and we feel real discomfort when we hear that, because it doesn't fit. 
We want that evil man to be evil in every way, and it's not so much that we want. It's something gets very uncomfortable in the processing because we get a picture that we haven't managed to make coherent. And then um, there is a famous experiment by Paul Rosen in which you show people a glass of orange juice, a perfectly normal glass of orange juice, and you give them a sticker, and you ask them to write the word cyanide on the sticker, and to stick the sticker on the orange juice, and then you invite them to drink the orange juice. <laughs> and they don't want to. And that is because of fit. They know perfectly well that the orange juice is not dangerous. They just don't feel like doing it. This is the kind of associative coherence that I talk about. So system one creates the world we see, and mostly what we see is meaningful and well-structured. And the way that it achieves the coherence that our world normally has is in part by a property of that system. It, it's by suppressing ambiguity. When there are ambiguous stimuli are presented, and there are many, many examples of that, uh, we tend to perceive one interpretation and not to perceive another. Uh, in the book, and I, I gave the example that I can't think of another example now, but the, the standard example is she approached the bank. That most of you have heard in a particular way. You've thought of the bank as a financial institution with tellers and money and so on. But in the context of fishing, uh, the interpretation would be completely different. In the interpretation of fishing, it would be the bank of the river. And you do not notice, when you hear the word bank, that you have made a choice. This is called priming. And we become conscious of only one interpretation. It is chosen automatically, but it is chosen intelligently in context. And here I echo some of the things that Hillel uh, was saying earlier. My System one is characterized by exquisite sensitivity to context and by a tendency to create a single interpretation that makes sense. And my personal experience, and my favorite experience actually of priming, favorite example because I don't think there are many published examples that are better, is something that happened to me uh, personally a few months ago where my wife and I went uh, to dinner with a couple and you know, then Afterward, we were exchanging, exchanging notes, and my wife said of the man and the couple, uh, he is sexy. And, okay, so, uh, uh, and the next thing that she said was truly extraordinary and really bizarre. I mean, she said, he doesn't undress the maid himself. He doesn't undress the maid himself. That was very, very odd, and I was trying to understand how on earth, you know, where did that come from? Now, in fact, this is not what she had said. She had said he doesn't underestimate himself. <laughs> but the, the, the single word sexy had created a context within which, being slightly hard of hearing, I found it possible to hear a sentence that fitted the context extremely well. Now, what's important, I think, about that story is that I never doubted what I heard. I knew what my wife had said. Uh, there was no question about it. The only question, and that's where my system, too, was working overtime, is why on earth had she said that bizarre thing? It did not occur to me that the facts were different. It did not occur to me that she simply had said something else and what it might do. So my slow thinking was alerted because of the incongruity, and in this case, I failed to make sense of it. So system one, uh, so this is my theory, actually, of why we think we know things and why we're so confident in what we think we know. The confidence we have in our beliefs is not a judgment, it's a feeling, and it's a feeling that comes about when we have managed to produce, or system one has produced for us, because it happens automatically, 
a story that makes sense. And when the story makes sense and there is no ambiguity in it because the ambiguity has been dissolved away or has been resolved in some way, then we know things. And the essence of knowing things is that there is no doubt, there is no question, there is no alternative way of interpreting the world. Sometimes it's bizarre, sometimes we don't understand it, as in the example I gave. But system one, which is the one that really generates most of our thoughts and most of our emotions and our feelings, uh, system one doesn't do doubt. Doubt comes from system two. And doubt involves inherently maintaining several possibilities about what is true. And that happens when there is trouble. And that's why, that's when system one calls system two into operation, is when there is trouble, when, the, when there is an incongruity is encountered. That, by the way, happens extremely fast and extremely efficiently, and our associative system and associative memory does beautifully in that task. And here my favorite example, again, one I cited in the book, is an experiment in which uh, people hear sentences uh, while their brain events are being, brain is being imaged, and the sentence spoken by upper class British male voice, don't expect me to imitate it, uh, says, I have large tattoos all down my back. And within approximately one third of a second, the brain responds with a typical reaction of surprise. And this, in a way, is astonishing, because to generate that surprise, you need to have recognized the voice, your brain needs to have recognized the voice, categorized it as an upper-class British male, brought up the stereotype of upper-class British males, recognized that that stereotype really doesn't fit very well, with the ideas of large tattoos down the back, and generated an appeal for help, which mobilizes system two. There is a surprise, something needs to be resolved, and we need to do some work about it. Now, when we encounter arguments, we think that we have beliefs because of arguments, but in fact, it works the other way around. We believe in arguments because we believe their conclusions. That is, the beliefs and the opinions come first, and then we believe in arguments that are psychologically coherent or cohesive with the conclusions we believe in. Here is an experiment that demonstrates that. Students are asked, is the following logical argument a valid argument? And the argument goes as follows. As follows, all roses are flowers. Some flowers fade quickly. Therefore, some roses fade quickly. Is this a valid argument? It's not. Uh, it is entirely possible that all the flowers that fade quickly are not roses. 80% of students at good university said this argument is valid. And the reason that they say the argument is valid is because the conclusion is true. And there seems to be that seems to be sufficient for people, that the conclusion is true, that is, and what they believe by that, they know that some roses fade quickly. Uh, the belief in the conclusion governs the beliefs in the arguments. So this seems to be the key. There is a critical lesson from this, that people generally reason backwards. When we believe in a conclusion, we believe in the argument. It sounds like an inference, but it really is not an inference. We are much less reasonable than we feel we are. We have beliefs and we have reasons, but we do not believe what we believe primarily because of the reasons that come to our mind. We believe what we believe primarily because actually we have been told to believe these things by people that we believe and trust. And that realization is actually quite difficult because subjectively, that's not the way it feels. Subjectively, we feel we have good reasons for our beliefs, and other people who do not accept our beliefs are unreasonable. We think we are our system too, and we think other people are wrong. But in fact, there is in all of us 
that machinery, that psychological machinery, which operates to remove doubt and operates to give us the sense that we know things even when we don't. Thank you.